Hi and welcome to today's video and what I'm actually going to be doing today is taking a look at some of the brochures that I acquired from this year's NEC Classic Car Show. So that's the Classic Car Show 2023. Let's have a look at what we got. Uh, there's quite a lot. Uh, we're not going to be going through all of them in this particular session but we can certainly take a look at a couple and see what we have. So here is just a small selection of what we have. We have a load of Ford brochures, and we also have sat on top of the 3V40, sorry, not 3V43, 3V31 that you can see here, and it's actually a, an 894 one, so it's a multi-broadcast. Uh, three bags worth of brochures. That one's thick with brochures, as are these other two. And we have another bag here, a little teaser there, the Alpha 164 brochure, which is also full of brochures as well. We also have, from a good friend of mine, a box of old car radios that we got to look through. We also have this uh, Alba affair, which will hopefully be providing its CRT for the Ferguson that sat up on the top shelf there with a flat tube so that's going to be rather exciting and something that we'll be looking into but anyway back to the brochures now if you are a viewer of the channel you'll know that i've got a bit of a love for ford um it's not something that i shout about an awful lot but i love fords i love fords from mainly the 70s and 80s especially the Mark II Granada, the Capri 78 slash Carla slash Mark III, whatever you want to call it, and everything else in between. Now, what I rather like about these is I've managed to get October, November 1982 and March 1982. So you've got last of the line Cortina, first of the line Ford Sierra. So what one should we take a look at first? Well, let's have a look at the Sierra one. So we'll just grab this out of its uh, little pockety thing. There we go. And we can have a look at what we have. The new Ford Sierra, man and machine in perfect harmony. And Ford gives you more, and that was their strap line for Quite a while, actually. There's one here from 81. Ford gives you more. Um, wasn't there in 1980. And it wasn't certainly wasn't there in 78. But here we are in 82 with Ford gives you more. So straight away, we are through to the Ford Fiesta. And this is the way that these brochures certainly these car brochures apparently there was 160 of these in total uh these car brochures always started off at the very bottom of the uh hierarchical range in this case with the ford fiesta now the ford fiesta was styled particularly in mark one form was styled by i think it was tom De tom tajada who also styled the uh Detamoso pantera so it was a very stylish car for its time, built in Valencia in Spain, if I recall correctly, and was Ford's, I want to say Ford's first small front-wheel drive car. In fact, it may have been their first front-wheel drive car, although I am happy to be corrected on that. It's very like the Austin Mini Metro, used existing mechanicals in the form of the Kent Crossflow, which I think was actually called the Valencia in this. Um, and it used um, some existing interior trim and features from other models, obviously to sort of keep things cheap during the development. But the big switch was to that transverse front wheel drive set up in fact no it's not the first front wheel drive ford um i've just suddenly thought in brazil there was the ford 
Corsell and Del Rey. It was originally the Corsell, which was based on the Renault 12, so that technically wasn't a Ford design, but that was a longitudinal uh, north-south engine arrangement, being that it was based on the Renault 12, but that was a front-wheel drive car. Anyway, we start off right at the bottom of the range uh, with the Fiesta Popular, a um, quite a depressing model, to be honest with you has absolutely nothing they have to boast about the fact that it's got a thermostatically controlled engine fan although back then that was quite a big thing given that a lot of the fans in cars were driven from uh, the engine uh, well mounted on the front of the water pump and then just driven by the engine itself you'll also notice the lack of well a radio which is uh, not certainly wasn't unusual for back then and just really the lack of anything at all. Um, the Popular Plus, you could get the optional 1100cc engine. You did get the tailgate wash and wipe. And look at this, you also got the centre console with that really cool oval Ford clock, which uh one of my sort of favourite clocks in a car, to be honest. It was used in everything. That clock saw service in, oh, well, quite literally everything. Capri, uh, Mark II Escort, etc. I think it was in the Mark II Escort. Might be wrong, but uh, there you go. Then we go up to the Fiesta L, where we are introduced to a radio. Brilliant. That radio was the Ford P21 radio, which uh, I think was medium and long wave. I seem to remember my mum's uh, 1100GL having the same setup. Um, although hers was finished in a nice metallic finish. I can't remember the exact name. It wasn't jade green. It was a more modern uh, interpretation of jade green. Now, this is the Fiesta GL. The later GLs, like this, actually had the uh, the gear wood trim, which, as you can see there, has been taken directly from the simulation tree. Um, very nicely done, as you can see. It almost looks like wood. You do have the rear parcel shelf there for storing your parcels, but also, more importantly, covering the contents of your boot so that nobody can see what is in there. You also got the seats with the head restraints. Now, funny enough, on the 79 model that we had, we didn't have the head restraints. And that was something that was introduced later. So really our model was more akin to the Fiesta L, although we had slightly, a slightly plusher um, chocolate brown interior. But we were closer to the L in terms of specification, although we did have the cigar lighter, which the L lacks. The GL, as you can see, does come with the cigar lighter. We didn't have the four-spoke steering wheel, but we did have uh, a soft-field two-spoke steering wheel. That, funny enough, was the first car I ever drove was uh, an 1100 GL. Then we had the Fiesta S. Uh, this one actually has a different style of wheel to the earlier model. Uh, you do get the nice red surround on the instrument cluster and the all-important rev counter, as well as these rather nice buckets with uh, the Carla trim, as you can see there. So this sort of like tartan fabric in Ford terms was known as Carla trim, and it was present on a lot of Fords during this particular era, especially the Capri. Then at the top of the range, we have the gear. In this case, this car is featured in this rather nice bronze colour, which I think was Celtic bronze. Yes, it is. I'm just looking there. Celtic bronze. Actually, a really nice colour, to be honest with you. One of my sort of favourite Ford colours of this particular year. The uh, simulation tree has given us a rather nice bold walnut finish which is rather lovely and a radio cassette player very nice indeed nice brown velour seats obviously available in different colors depending on the color of the exterior with 
head restraints. Quite a luxurious little car for its time. And also full door cards. No sort of painted metal here. Those were full door cards with the little bin there that you can see. Interestingly though, I can't seem to find the clock because where the clock would normally be is this weird little tray here. So that's odd. I don't know where the clock is, but uh, yeah, that's actually quite confusing. And further on in the range, we have the Fiesta XR2, only available with the 1600 overhead valve Kent slash Valencia engine, developing a very healthy 84 brake horsepower through a twin Venturi Weber fuel toilet with automatic choke and electronic ignition. So electronic ignition was really sort of coming into its own uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, and was one of the sort of first steps towards reduced maintenance. Um, electronic ignitions were arguably a lot easier to, easier to set up, they were a lot more reliable, and they needed tuning far less often. You'll also see we've got these rather nice bolstered uh, front bucket seats as well. Reclining, obviously. List of specifications, which is always quite fun to look through. List of optional equipment. Again, always something that's quite less interesting to look through. Black paint was always an option as well. Now, don't get excited about the climate control pack. It doesn't include climate control. What it does include, though, is tinted glass all round, a gradient band windscreen, and opening front quarter windows. So these little windows here will open and that is effectively your climate control, as well as your tints as well. So simpler times. And also, look at the size of these tyres. 155 SR12 radial ply tyres. Very nice. Tiny little tyres. Got the price list. So we go from... £3,255.40 for the popular 950, all the way up to £5,150 for the XR2. Then we come on to the Ford Escort. At this time, this would have been only a couple of years old, as it was released in 1980. So still a fairly big thing. Uh, this was Ford's, I think, um, second transverse engine front-wheel drive car. There were versions for the European market and also a version for the American market. Similar in appearance, similar in mechanical specification, but also very different in some ways as well. The American version was more, well, more Americanized, obviously. Um, but I think the American version also came with a 1900cc version of, or 1.9 litre version of the CVH. Whereas uh, over in Europe, we got the 1100, the 1300 and the 1600 CVH units. Later, uh, you would have got an 1100 overhead valve unit. You would have got a 1300 and a 1400 overhead cam and obviously the 1600 as well. So I'm pretty certain they did do an 1100 um cvh although looking at this it says it's the overhead valve so it's actually the old kent engine so it may have been 1300 upwards i'd need to check the earlier brochure for that to be honest with you but you can see here that we go through from escort which would have been uh the absolute base model then escort l Escort GL and then Escort Gear. And the range would have expanded over the years as well. So you can see that the Escort Gear here has actually got electric front windows. Um, that was an optional cost. So this was in Celtic bronze as well, which is a really photogenic colour. Actually, it sort of looks really good against a lot of different backgrounds. It also had, in this instance, we had 
yeah, electric front windows, optional extras, uh, metallic paint, central door locking and electric front windows, tailgate wash and wipe and 175 profile tyres. Celtic bronze was not available on the Escort gear in the 1983 model year, so this would have been more geared towards 83, being that it was late 82. So a lot of these photos are actually used in earlier brochures as well, which is why there's a bit of crossover. And it's also why they have to put these little notes in to say that this trim isn't available or this colour isn't available for the following new model year. Top of the range, carburettor Escort XR3R, uh, sorry, XR3. There was no I, it was just the XR3. So it had, in this case, a twin Venturi Weber fuel toilet slash carburettor. Again, with automatic choke and electronic ignition. It's actually very similar to the Fiesta XR2. To differentiate uh, from the XR2, the XR3i came out in about 83, 84, uh, which saw a useful increase in performance and desirability. You'll also notice I've got a back flash up there for an XR3. Oh, gas shocks all round as well. Now, the Escort Estate cars, at this time, they were only available as this weird sort of three-door combination and only available up to GL trim level. Five-door Estates became available later during the run of that particular model. Here we've got all the optional equipment. Um, electrically operated front windows were available from the L upwards and also on the GL Estate and the L Estate. So you could actually get your GL Estate to be almost gear specification. Don't get too excited about the executive pack. So that's got a number two next to it. So we need to have a look at two. So executive pack consists of a push button radio, medium wave, long wave, not even FM, with a stereo cassette, that's the RST21P, tilt slide sunroof, uh, and electrically operated radio aerial. So that was your executive pack. And the bit that was very exciting, the new Ford Sierra. Man and machine in perfect harmony. Made a really big thing about the Sierra back in the day, um, about its aerodynamic nature, the rather nice uh tailored or rather sort of um profiled towards the driver interior and controls the fact that it was very aerodynamic and the fact that uh, it replaced the ford cortina mechanically again uh, it was just refined versions of the same engines that had been seen previously in the Cortina. But there were some big differences. Fully independent rear suspension being one of them. And a redesign of the uh, sort of Pinto and Cologne units to make them more efficient and increase longevity as well. Also, big thing made on rust protection. Although, in reality... They rusted slower, but they still rusted as badly as Fords of old. So, yeah. A nice attempt, but uh, it was okay. And the Pinto, so the overhead cam Pinto, available in 1.3, 1 1.6 and 2 litre forms. Uh, in about 84, 85, it was also available as a 1.8 as well, which was like your sort of tax break, company car tax break special. Um, a lot of manufacturers started to produce engines of 1.8 litre capacity, which sat quite nicely between the 1.6 and the 2 litre. Let's get on to the exciting bit. Oh my God, that's depressing. Look at that. You get yourself your Sierra Saloon, you have, well, nothing. Literally no Oh, you do get a heater. So, and you've got your vents and a fan. Oh, and a handbrake. And some seats. 
and a door mirror, but you also get this matte black front grille. That is as base as you can get, only available with the 1.3 or 1.6 Pinto units. Oh, you could get the five-speed gearbox on the 1.6 litre model. So there is that, I guess. But this was bottom of the range, totally stripped out, absolutely nothing. Interestingly, no free door option, so that didn't come until a little bit later. Then we have the Sierra L, which, believe it or not, was actually a very useful increase in interior comfort. I mean, the seats are a lot nicer, for starters. You've got a radio. Um, you could also get the 2.3 litre diesel if you wanted. You've got some nice wheel trims. You've got the coloured front grille so it looks less awful uh, than it did previously and you also got two speed wipers as well and a clock so going for the L should really be the minimum that you would accept uh, it would certainly be the minimum that I would accept I mean for goodness sakes that's just depressing Look at that big empty space there to store, I don't know, 1980s things, your super mooses or an Arctic roll, maybe. Perhaps even a Vionetta, although it would melt. In fact, all of those options would melt. Um, I don't know, a book, maybe. A clock from your house, so you could at least tell the time with something. You don't even get a cigar lighter. I mean... You couldn't even smoke in the car, despite the fact that it's got an ashtray. You'd have to use a lighter or matches. Oh, that's just miserable. At least here you've got a cigar lighter. At least here you could enjoy a smoke. Whereas in the saloon, God, you may as well just enjoy, I don't know, getting to your destination as quickly as possible. <laughs> then, a little bit more exciting... The GL. Ooh, yeah, we've got some extra warning lights, which is nice. Um, oh, automatic option as well. Rather nice uh, seat trim. Same wheel trims as the L, but uh, we do get adjustable internal remote uh, adjustable door mirrors. So we don't have to open the window to adjust our mirrors. And that's a nice touch. Slightly fancier steering wheel. Um... We still have the push button radio, but we do get this range of useful uh, warning lights here, which is nice. So, yeah, the GL, far less miserable. Um, at this stage also, we've got the 2 litre and the 2.3 V6 option becoming available. However, we can no longer get it in the uh, 1300, thank goodness. Phew. And if you were very lucky... And your fleet manager really liked you. All the way up to the Sierra gear. Oh yeah, look at that. you got a very similar style wheel trim to the uh, L and GL. But it's got three venti things on it. How elegant, how sleek, how, how great for the time. That was glass sunroof. Bloody brilliant. Lovely seats with these nice velour bits on them. Electric front windows. Was that an option? Um, no, I think it might have been standard, actually. There you go. There's the switches there on the centre console. Obviously, as the range uh, progressed through the 80s, it became available with 2-litre EFI. Um, also became available with all-round electric windows and a more fully-fledged um, trip computer. And I think from about 84, 85 onwards, you could get the range, certainly GL and upwards, with air conditioning as well. So air conditioning became an option fairly early on. 
which was um, quite unusual for the times. Air conditioning wasn't really something that was offered. Austin Rover, bizarrely, or Austin Morris, rather bizarrely offered it as an option on the Mini Metro. Um, if I recall, that was Unipart Option GOL 3000, if I recall correctly. And then we got the estate cars. <clears throat> and unusually for Ford, you could get the estate range in every trim level, including, God, the, the, the Sierra estate car, just the base trim, or the gear, which would be my option. My preference would be to go as high as possible. Um, realistically, if I was buying brand new back then, I probably would have been able to plump for the L with a metallic finish, but that was probably about it, to be honest with you. Then we have the options. Um, as you can see, air conditioning is not an option as yet, although Econo lights, that seems to appear a lot, and I don't know what that actually was. Um, wasn't available on the diesels, but I think it was a couple of lights fitted on the dash, which told you if you were driving economically, or if you were not driving economically. And then, just trying to see if we had any prices. And then, yes, 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 yes. The Capri, in this case, the 2.8 injection. Now, interestingly, for this time, the Capri still actually had a range. It wasn't just laser and injection special. Um, during the early 80s, Ford actually sort of cut the range down quite a bit, but here you could still get the Capri L, you could still get the LS, you could still get the Capri GL, you could still get the Capri S, which was um, a two litre at this time, and you could still get the Capri gear um, albeit in this case, you could only get it with the two litre engine. Um, this one's shown here in Imperial Red, which is really nice colour actually. And you could get it with automatic transmission as well. But really, you started to see a lot less of these sort of mid-range um, trim options for the Capri during the early 80s. I mean, what typically sort of tended to happen, sort of the most popular option, a lot of people went for the Capri LS. Uh, that was quite a popular option for the time. Um, you also had some special editions which used these sort of red interiors as well, like the Capri Cabaret, if I remember rightly. And you saw a lot less of the GL specification. You did still see the 2 litre S, but you didn't really see the gear anymore. That became a lot less common um, during this sort of time period. So people were sort of tending to put their money towards the 2.8 injection. And that's probably why you saw a reduction in the range over the next coming years, so that you just had, I think from about 1984 onwards, you had 2.8 injection special. So the injection version grew, or rather acquired, limited slip rear diff and uh, the, I think it was the Type 9 five speed. It lost the Carla trim, still kept the Recaros, but the Recaros were half leather. And... That was basically your Capri range. The range pretty much very quickly went from one, two, three, four, five, six options down to just two. And then at the top of the tree, the Ford Granada. In this case, Mark II post facelift, so a Mark II facelift. A very effective reskin of the Mark I Granada but done just that little bit better. No base Granada saloon here. Your base option was the Granada L that came with the two litre Pinto or the 2.3 litre V6. And you actually got a radio and some seats. 
which is nice. Oh, you did get some remote door mirrors as well. So that was uh, also nice as well. So good for you if you manage to get a two, a two liter L. But immediately, quite a jump up the range was actually going to the GL. You, you had pretty much immediately electrically adjustable driver's seat, electrically operated front windows, tinted glass, push button radio cassette with four speakers, electrically operated remote control and heated driver and passenger door mirrors. Why would you, oh, and this rather nice check function thing as well. Why would you go for an L? I mean, why? Why would you go for an L when the GL is here? And look at how nice it is. It has everything that you need. And you could get it with a 2 litre, 2.3 or 2.8 litre V6s. Interestingly, in the world of police granadas, you could get the 2.8 litre version, uh, the 2.8 litre V6 in the Granada L as well. And that's a very weird um, option. You did see some ex-police cars around in the early 80s, um, or rather throughout the 80s rather which were badged up as a Granada 2.8L. I remember seeing one once and being rather surprised, but apparently, yet yeah, they were available for the police use. So stripped out, base model interior, but with the 2.8 V6. Near top of the range, you've got the Granada gear. And interestingly, the Granada gear X. Now, earlier, I think in about 81, you had the Gear, but you had no Gear X. So the Gear X wasn't immediately available at launch. But with the Gear, you've got uh, some rather nice wood from the simulation tree. Rather nice velour interior. Uh, 2.8 litre V6. Ventilated front disc brakes. Full instrumentation. Rather nice radio cassette. And then top of the range with the Gear X, we have air conditioning as standard. We have either the 2.8 with the Solex or the 2.8i with the Bosch K-Jet uh, engines available. Heated drivers and front passenger seats, which I think were also electrically adjusted as well. Um, a trip computer, which is there. And, yeah, automatic transmission as well. Then the Granada Estates, uh, they were available all the way from L through the diesel, all the way up to the Gear X and the 2.8 injection estate car with its complete, with its white TRX wheels and shadow line, which is a BMW term, I know, but blacked out chrome, which was a rather nice option. And, oh, that's rather nice, the black roof rack as well. Actually a very stylish, rather cool looking uh, car, to be honest with you, which takes us quite nicely onto the Granada 2.8 injection. So you had pretty much GL specification, but with these really nice Recaros, um, manual gearbox, white TRX wheels, front air dam with the 2.8 logo on it, and Granada 2.8 injection badging on the back, and this really nice boot spoiler. Good looking car. Bloody good looking car, actually. And interestingly, you had the Granada diesel taxi option um, with power assisted steering, front fog lamps, uh, remote control drivers and front passenger door mirrors, Overriders, heavy duty vinyl seat trim, ashtrays on all doors, boot lights and two additional interior lights mounted on the centre door pillars, fascia mounted clock and trip recorder, centre console modified to accept a taxi meter, uh, electric suppression for two way radio, wiring for a roof mounted sign, uh, drive cable for taxi meter, a visual slash acoustic alarm triggered by a foot near the clutch pedal. Um, so like a panic alarm, central door and boot locking and fuel locking, fuel locking, fuel tank locking cap. It was actually a weirdly odd specification. It was like in between an L and a GL. So actually not that bad, to be honest with you. Had reclining front seats, so it was a comfortable car. 
Now the options are interesting because you could get air conditioning from GL upwards, uh, although it was standard on the Gear X. Um, automatic transmission, option across the range except on the injection and I think on the diesels as well. Um, oh, it's actually a five-speed transmission there at this time as well, so that's something. Driving lamps, standard on the injection, optional on the gear and gear X. Electrically operated front windows, optional on the L, standard on GL, injection, gear and gear X. Um, electrically operated rear windows, optional on the GL and injection, but standard on the gear and gear X. That's why the injection was pretty much um, GL interior specification, but gear X injection uh, mechanical specification also with the added feature of gas shocks. Effectively, you can think of it as a Ford Granada GLS injection. So the preface would have been the GLS injection, 2.8 injection, the facelift, 2.8 injection. So coming to the end now, we've got the price list, funnily enough, for the Granada. So the one I want, which would be the 2.8 injection, I'd have to put back £10,745. And I would want that optional air conditioning, so I'm going to have to go for... An extra £1,012.37 to get my air conditioning. Um, and I've got to be honest, I'm happy with that. Very happy indeed. I don't need anything else. Air conditioning, I've got the electric front windows, so I'm happy. I've got my TRXs. Uh, I've got my 2.8 litre injection power unit. Don't really need anything else. got everything else that I need. Um... Oh, hang on a minute. I will also pay £195.25 to get the trip computer, which you could get on the GL as well. So, more than happy with that. Perfect. I'm happy. Finally, list of option packs. So, this is basically the different option packs you could get for each model. little bit on accessories. You actually had separate accessory brochures by this time as well. Snow chains, which was something you used to see quite a lot of back then. Uh, some pictures of the various accessories that you could get. And end of the brochure. So, got to admit, I really enjoyed that. If you enjoyed it, why don't you hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell and do all that other YouTube-y type stuff. And I'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks for watching.